Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Mark Backoff. I'm a truck captain at Station 22 A Shift and also one of your action officers on the OCFA Apparatus Committee. Here to talk to you this morning about the Type 1 engines shown behind me. These 2019 KME engines, we made some significant changes on in order to clean up and declutter the cab and uh, also provided a more safer working environment for our personnel and we'll go over those this morning. So just to make sure you're orienting yourself to the proper Type 1 engine, there's a few visual indicators on the outside of the rig that we'll cover in a little bit, but also this will be for shop numbers 52, 93 through 99, and those would be the four digit numbers you would normally find either on the windshield or on the rear of the apparatus. So why don't you follow me and we'll take a walk around the rig and cover some of the changes. As you can see from the front of the rig right here, they're very similar to the previous generation engines with the lighting packages and the siren complement. This one does also have the mechanical grinder, which we've done in the last couple years. The first change you'll notice from the outside of the apparatus is the compartment door, the cab compartment door here behind the engineer. The idea is it's designed to hold the engineer's turnout equipment in a safe and readily accessible location. Following me back here, you'll notice the pump panel layout is very similar to what we currently have on this, this generation of engines. With one exception, down here the pump override is, is different and we'll cover that here a little bit later in this video. Also you'll notice up here, their switches are slightly different as far as the pump panel lights and the air horn activation button. And that was also due to the change of going multiplexing on this rig, which we'll cover once we get into the cab of the apparatus. As far as the layout in compartment one here, it will be very similar to what we currently have in all the uh, other engines with the engineer compartment being laid out extremely similar nozzles and uh, fittings in this compartment. The first large change you'll notice is in the over axle compartments. So in an effort to declutter the rig and also clean it up, make it a safer for us, was one of the things that was brought to our attention was moving the SCBAs out of the cab. And in order to do that, we put them both in the over axle compartment here. So this uh, SCBA here forward would be for the engineer, one for the firefighter or vice versa, however it's set up on your particular engine. In addition, you'll uh, have additional 24 inches width of space here for gear bags and uh, wildland equipment, whatever else you prefer not to carry with you inside the cab. One of the other big changes on this rig was going to a double wide SCBA bottle compartment here, which for now, we've got one SCBA bottle in the forward compartment. And then back in this compartment here, we'll have the SCBA bottle in addition to the chalk box in an effort to declutter the side of the rig. The fuel fill, was designed so that there's a chain on here so we don't lose the caps, but in an effort to keep the paint from getting damaged, don't just let it drop down, hang it right over the side, and that way the cap's there and ready to be placed back on when you're done fueling the rig. There's a couple significant changes in this compartment, one being that we've shrunk down the EMS compartment boxes for a couple reasons. Number one, to provide some more uh, space for tool storage in the back of the compartment here. And the second, to minimize the amount of EMS restock that we're carrying on our rigs. There was a significant uh, increase in how much we were carrying and uh, EMS and the apparatus committee came to an agreement that we were able to shrink down the compartmentation to hold just what's the bare essentials to get your apparatus restocked and back into service. The biggest change in here too as well was that this is where the streamlight and the uh, tick are gonna be located in order to, again, remove those things that we're taking with us into fires outside of the cab and put them in compartmentation. You'll also notice above these three compartments on the engineer's side, we have a, what is being referred to as a coffin box. The idea was to get a lot more storage up top for the things that we don't typically use as frequently. The big items that were being discussed, we're gonna be moving the MREs up there, the SCED, and swift water bags are the initial items that were being suggested to be moved up and out of uh, the lower compartments. If you follow me around to the back of the rig here, in order to get the coffin box up there, we had to remove two of the tools that were typically carried up there right now, the rubbish hook and the closet hook. In order to do that, we have a new tool storage module that's located back here adjacent to the four inch hose bed. This was designed to carry the rubbish hook, the closet hook, long handle tools, street key, and then the tool heads will all be stored in here as well. 
This apparatus also features the lock and load hose bed cover that we're currently using on some of our other rigs from this generation and we'll discuss uh, one of the major changes to the lock and load when we go up top. A couple other differences on the back of the apparatus here I'd like to point out. We do have a light switch now for both the step lights and the hose bed lights. Flipping the toggle switch up will activate the step lights not only on the rear of the apparatus but also on the sideboards of the apparatus. Those will also be on um, when the headlights are on and the maxis are set, just as a frame of reference. We'll switch those off. If you toggle the switch down, there's hose bed lighting up there in the hose bed. That's a little difficult to see because we're operating in the day right now. That will also turn itself on when utilizing the lock and load hose bed cover and we'll demonstrate that in just a second. You'll also notice on the back of the engine here, we have a camera which is set up to provide you a view of the rear of the apparatus as you're backing up. This will not take the place of using a backup person, but it will provide you an enhanced view on the monitor we'll show you when we go into the cab. Up here, as we talked about, is the hose bed lock and load cover. So now in order to activate the lock and load hose bed cover, to press the red button, and push back. As I start to do this, you'll also notice that I've moved the ladder rack out of the way because the hose bed cover will not clear the ladder rack when the ladder rack is in the fully up and locked position. Continue to slide the hose bed cover back until you hear it lock into position. At that point, you can lift it up to either access the hose that you have bundled over here, rebed any of the hose beds, or access the upper part of the tool storage. So one of the things you'll notice up here that might be different than some of the previous lock and load hose bed covers and is also going to be retrofitted is a new lock. This lock is designed to slide in right here and will prevent the hose bed cover from coming down in high winds or at any other time without being ready for the hose bed cover to come down. To lock it, you just slide the arm into place, unlock it, slide it back down and replace it where you found it. You'll also notice that the two shocks now no longer have a lock on them, and that was by design in order to make sure to utilize this lock right here anytime you're bedding the hose or have the lock and load in the up position. Up here on the coffin boxes, you'll notice a butterfly latch. There's one to the rear and one to the front of the box. You need to unlock both in order to be able to lift the lid. When you lift the lid, you're provided LED lighting up here to be able to see what you've got inside your coffin box. And also just as a frame of reference, it is does utilize a proxy switch and will show up on the multiplex screen as an open compartment should it be left open. And again, some of the items you're going to find up here that haven't been completely finalized yet will be the SCED, the MREs, and the Swift water bags. Again, as a reminder, Having the lock and load hose bed cover open or the foam fill door open will activate the interlocks and not allow the ladder rack to be operated in the up or down position. In order to get the ladder rack to operate again, simply close the foam fill door and make sure that the lock and load door is closed and you will be able to operate the ladder rack again. If you follow me over to the officer side of the rig, we've got a few other changes over here I'd like to point out. In this compartment, nothing changed. But just as a frame of reference, we still have all the same shelving that we did previously on the uh, other engines of this generation. Also, we have both uh, dual-sided fuel and uh, the fuel cap over here works exactly the same as the opposite side where we just have enough chain to drape it over the side of the door to prevent the damage to the paint below. As you notice above, once again, we have a uh, tandem SCBA bottle storage compartment and the design plan right now is to have one SCBA bottle in here, one in this storage compartment, and then room for the additional O2 bottle in this compartment as well to free up a little bit more space in the rear EMS compartment. Again, in the over axle compartment, you'll find a bracketing for two SCBAs, one for the company officer and one for the firefighter sitting on this side. Again, with the 24 inch spacing in between for additional gear storage. In this compartment, there's two significant changes. Number one, the stream light from the cab is being moved out here to this shelf. And the other one is the extinguisher module that's been constructed here. The idea was to get the extinguishers on a horizontal plane, freeing up a little bit more additional space below here to accommodate the cones and other equipment that we'd be able to fit into this compartment. 
As we continue down the side of the apparatus here, the pump panel on this side hasn't had any significant changes. It's very similar to the previous generations. Backboard storage, your transverse hose beds, and ladder rack controls. Continuing down the length of the cab here, midway down again, we've got the gear storage compartment, this one being for the company officer, which provides adequate storage for turnout gear in this compartment. So on our ladder rack controls here, a couple things worth noting. In the off position, you won't have the green ready light. As soon as you switch it on, assuming that there is adequate air pressure in the tanks, the auxiliary tanks, you'll get a green light on here stating that it's ready to be operated. Up and down toggle switch, and one thing worth noting is on this generation and the 2018s, uh, one of the biggest complaints we were getting from the field was the ladder rack drop speeds being close to 30 seconds. These are now down to 18 seconds, um, which is a significant increase in the deployment speed of the ladder rack. Okay, guys, why don't you follow me into the cab and we'll talk about some of the changes and uh, operation of the equipment inside the cab. On first glance, you'll notice it looks really similar to the previous versions with just some slight uh, aesthetic differences. But the battery power continues to be in the same location. It's denominated by a red switch here. In order to get your batteries on, click the switch up. It'll go through its initial startup and then hit the ignition switch. Wait for the dash cluster to cycle through its startup. And then you'll be able to depress the start button to go ahead and activate the starter and start the apparatus. You notice the yellow light up above refers to your check engine light, and if that's illuminated, that's identifying to you that there's a check engine issue. Directly below is the lube system light, and only when that is illuminated will that tell you that there's an issue with the SKF lube system. Uh, one of the other things you might notice different from our previous versions is the mechanically plumbed air tank gauges over here, and that was uh, due to some failures we were having with the electronic version, so in order to keep the rigs in service longer, and not have that issue, we went to a mechanically plumbed gauge. You'll notice the pump shift over here looks slightly different than previous versions, and uh, that's for two reasons. Number one, another issue we had had was uh, the air actuator in the pump shift would uh, have some issues and cause the rig to be out of service. The second being, because we went to a fully multiplexed engine with very few exceptions, we switched over to a multiplex pump shift, and we'll go over the overrides for that shortly later in this video. Uh, continuing over, we've got the adjustment again for the steering column remains the same. Pull for tilt, push to move the steering wheel up and down, and on the turn signal indicator, you have your controls for your windshield wipers, the intermittent setting, low and high speed. Continuing over to the right side of the steering column, there's a fast idle switch and your fuel prime switch, should you need either one. We continue to use the Valor seats for the seating in the cab, and the uh, front seats are air ride seats. so. You'll notice the first lever switch right here is the adjustment for the up and down and for the amount of air pressure applied to the, the shock underneath the seat. Simply push it up to bring the seat in the up position, push it down to let the air out and let the seat down. The red button right here is an air actuated switch. Depressing it will allow you to slide the seat forward and back. And these next three switches refer to the, or utilize for the lumbar support in the back of your um, seat that you have here. Simply depress up to apply air to them and apply air to the bladder in the lumbar support. Depress down to let the air out and let the bladder decrease. So as we go to the top of the dash cluster here, you'll notice that there's a blue C monitor for the batteries on the rig. Nothing really to concern yourself with there, um, but it might be used for diagnostic purposes with fleet services or communication services. Directly above is a green light for the Opticom. It'll only come on when the master switch is on, the primary warning switch is on, and the maxi brakes are released. And it's to let you know that your Opticom is in the operation mode. Now you'll notice these switches look significantly different from the previous models, and that's because we've gone to that full multiplex system. In doing so, one huge benefit we got was doing the labels for each switch above the switch instead of on the switch so that they will no longer wear off. As in previous models, the master switch in the up position will activate the lights for each individual one that you've selected if it's in the up position. You can start with them all in the down position or you can have them in the up position as you currently probably do on your apparatus. First one being primary warning which will activate all code three lights on the outside of the rig. The rear warning which uh, if you have the primary warning deselected 
will continue to left, leave your rear amber lights on. And you'll notice the wigwag right now is in the flashing function, letting you know that it is not currently active. Releasing the maxi brakes will allow the wigwag lights to work when responding. Continuing across, you've got floodlights for both the left, right sides for the floods on the back of the, uh, mounted to the back of the cab. The rear flood for your rear floodlights, which will also become active if you have it in reverse and the master and primary warning switches are activated, or you can individually just activate it on your own. Front flood will uh, turn two white lights on in the forward facing overhead light bar. Left alley and right alley, turn on the alley lights on each individual side on the light bar. And the air and electric switch right here is to determine which will be utilized for your horn ring. And finally, the ground light switch in the up position will activate all ground lights underneath the apparatus for scene lighting at night. Okay guys, one of the biggest internal changes to this generation of engines is the change to full multiplexing. And what that means for everybody else that's not familiar with multiplexing and what it does, is that a lot more controls are now being run through the multiplex system, which is on the screen here behind me. There's one of these on each side of the upper dash, and this replaces that screen that we had on the lower dash on previous generations. Okay, as we're looking at the screen now, you'll notice that it's got, this is the default screen display, and you'll notice it's got controls for a few different things, but also more importantly, in the center of the screen, just below the time, is the seatbelt indicator. This is replacing the current seatbelt indicator that we have on previous generations. So for the company officer and the engineer's knowledge on either side, they'll be able to see if somebody's number one sitting in the seat and number two, whether or not the seatbelt is buckled. And that red will turn to a green when the seatbelt is buckled. Directly below it, where you see the left front cab door open is now where you would go to determine where the, which compartment door or cab door is open when you receive the alarm from the center of the upper dash here, either via the light and or the alarm. Just below that, you'll see that it's got a parking brake set light on and that's because it's all interfaced together. So one of the more common things that you'll be using this screen for is the heater and air conditioning controls. You'll see that there's buttons on either side of the screen to be able to assist you through this, but also be advised too that it is a touch screen so you can just push whatever one you're attempting to change by pushing the screen. So by switching over to the heater and air conditioning controls, you can see there's a power switch in the upper left-hand corner. The air conditioning, which won't come on right now because the vehicle is not on, but just by depressing, you'll see a change in the button up there on the screen. And then controls for the temperature. So either to make it cooler, hit the button on the left. To make it warmer, hit the button on the, on the right. And you can also use this, drag it over with your finger if you don't feel like using the buttons. Just below that, the front and rear fan speeds three position settings, obviously the, this side being the front fan to control the front fan speeds and have those different potentially from the rear fan speeds. In the middle, you'll see the airflow control and that either determines where the air is going, either uh, from the upper dash, down below, or through the defroster. To get back to the home screen, simply depress the home button. While there's mirror controls on here, you can actually utilize the mirror controls on here to adjust your left and right larger mirrors, but we maintained the mirror controls in the lower dash and I'll cover that shortly to show you where that is. Our DPF regen controls are now incorporated into this screen and by depressing this, you can either inhibit or do your regen for your vehicle. And finally, there's an instrument setting on here which was just part of the class one ultra view screen. By depressing that, it allows you to visually see the instruments on the screen as well. By depressing the menu button, that'll change you to another screen here, which allows you to set the brightness for the screen, the brightness for your dash panel, set the time, and by depressing the diagnostic button, it'll allow you to visualize any engine fault codes you're currently experiencing on your apparatus. So the screen brightness refers to the screen on the screen of the multiplex here. Simply depress it and you've got both a day brightness level and a night brightness level to control your screen. When you've reached whatever brightness level you'd like, hit save and exit and it'll maintain that until it's changed. 
to change the backlight brightness for the dash gauges and the individual labeled switches, depress the backlight brightness, and that allows you to change the backlight on those on this screen. When you've reached the level of brightness you would like, hit save and exit, and those will be saved until changed again. Finally, to set the time on the screen, to press the set time button and change it to whatever time and date is accurate, hit set and exit, and it will be set. One other thing you'll notice on this apparatus that we maintain for the enhanced visibility is the federal signal monitoring system, which has two different camera angles. The first one here, when putting on the right blinker, will give you the blind side view on the officer's side of the rig. So that will come on with either the right blinker or if you activate the hazards, that will be on as well. You'll get that right side view. When placing the vehicle in reverse, it will automatically default to the rear camera view. As you can see on the screen now. And that's for that enhanced view while you have your backup person back there. Continuing down to the lower middle dash, you'll notice the transmission selector is still in the same position along with the parking brake. Where you will notice some changes is down along the lower level switches. Once again, the labeling is done above the switch. First uh, switch being for your siren brake, and that's for your mechanical grinder to be able to slow and stop down, stop that. The next switch over is your headlight marker. So first position being the parking lights, all the way up being your headlight switch, hazard switch, engine brake switch for the on off, and then your three position switch for your high, medium, and low settings on the Jacobs brake system. The next four switches are all for the windows, starting with the drivers, officers, and the two rear windows. You'll also notice over here, you have controls for your mirrors, as on previous versions. You can either control them from here or from your multiplex screen. Simply twist the knob over to the left to activate the mirror on the left, twist it to the right to operate the officer side mirror, and use the joystick to position the mirror where you would like it. Okay, in the middle lower dash, you'll notice the controls for the electric siren and the arrow stick control. Now, the reason they're all illuminated right now is because I do have the master switch on and the primary warning switch active. In order to get the foot pedal to work for the electric siren on the engineer side, you need to make sure this horn ring switch right here is not in the middle position. It needs to be switched over to the left. It'll illuminate a red light and that will give you the ability to use the foot pedal on the floor of the engineer steering column to be able to control the electric siren or change up the siren noise. The siren, electric siren and the grinder won't be active unless you have both the master switch on and the primary warning switch on, just as a reminder. Below, the narrow stick will come on anytime the code three lights are active or the rear warning lights are active and it'll set to the default function here. In order to get it to change for one of the other directional positions, simply to press the power button and switch it over to whichever version you'd like to be utilizing at the time to direct traffic. Below, you'll notice ports for 12-volt uh, plugins and also a USB port for charging any electronic devices as necessary. Also, as an added feature on this version of the apparatus, there will be Bluetooth connectivity through the headsets to be able to play music in a non-emergency setting. Just a few more things I want to cover in the back of the cab here. Again, on both sides of the compartment storage, we've got 12 volt and USB charging ports with a on off switch just to the left of it. Another change you'll notice here is in the map box and the map box now has a lid on it. And once again, that was in an effort to declutter and prevent projectiles from moving about the cab when responding number one and also number two in the unfortunate incident we ever got in an accident, it would help prevent the projectiles from going everywhere. This is mounted on a new communications chase here. And while this is not locked, communication services would appreciate it if you stayed out of this area unless directed to do so by a communication services representative. The other big change here in the back of the cab is the seats without SCBA brackets in them. So it's twofold. Number one, we've gotten something that we take into fires out of the cab and provided a cleaner environment for our personnel. And number two, we've also got a much more comfortable seat for riding around on the apparatus, which it seems like we do very, very frequently. 
Directly underneath the seat riser, one of the biggest changes too is there's another area for accessing the two battery chargers on the rig. Once again, communication services is requested that we stay out of the area unless directed to be in there by one of the communication services representatives, but it is underneath here and it is in an unlocked position just so you're aware. And finally, over here by the do back door, you'll notice two monitors for the battery chargers. Those can be utilized on a daily basis if you're experiencing any charging issues with your rigs or battery issues in an effort to further diagnose what might be the issue. Two more items worth noting in the rear of the cab here on our clutter-free cab is that we're no longer mounting the pick-headed axe here on the back of the engine doghouse, and that was to reduce one more projectile potential inside the apparatus that will now be mounted in the rear compartment on the engineer side. Also, we made the addition of a stainless steel rear wall for ease of cleaning behind the rear seats. You'll notice over here on the officer side of the rig, there's another camera mounted, and that's to give the engineer the blindside view of the apparatus on the monitor inside the cab. There's not a whole lot of significant changes on the company officer side of the apparatus, but one worth noting is the addition of the class one multiplex screen over here. And that was designed number one for situational awareness for the company officer with the seatbelt monitoring. Also, you'll notice to the right, the default screen here has the speedometer gauge for situational awareness, and also the ability for the company officer to be able to adjust the heater and or air conditioning controls so that the engineer would not have to do so while driving. There are two potential failures you can have with this apparatus with switching into pump. One is multiplex failure, and the second is an air failure. The first one, if you have a multiplex failure, you'll come out to your pump shift or you'll notice your pump shift doesn't have power. If that happens, step out of the cab, come back to the pump panel area, take the toggle cover up and switch this up to the multiplex position on this three positional switch. That will give you power back at your pump shift. Return to the pump shift, switch it into pump, put the vehicle in drive, Activate the manual lockup to provide power to the transmission, and you'll be able to utilize the apparatus as normal. The second type of potential failure is an air failure in the system. If after putting in the apparatus into pump as you normally would, and placing it into drive, and you come out to the pump panel and determine that the throttle ready light is not on, and the pump shift manual override is not on, Again, switch the switch up, this time to the manual position, which will dump the air actuating part of this valve. You need to come back over here, place the vehicle in neutral, return, and pull the pump shift override, engaging the pump, return to the vehicle, place it again in drive, and then operate the vehicle as normal. I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to get yourself oriented with our new 2019 KME Type 1 fire engines. If you have any further questions or needs for clarification, please feel free to contact any of your apparatus committee action officers. Myself at Station 22 A Shift, Brad Burns at Station 25 B Shift, or Dan Brown at Station 56 B Shift. Thank you.